Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we do celebrate and praise you for the opportunity to worship and honor you this day, for waking us from our slumber, from bringing us out of where we've been to a place where we might be, to a place surrounded with your holy word, a place surrounded with your will for our lives that we might know it more fully and follow it more closely. We pray and we ask, O Lord, that you would make the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable before you. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What's the most bizarre food you've ever eaten? Think, think about that for a second. I'm going to ask it again. You don't have to shut it out. Just think about it. What's the most bizarre food you've ever eaten? Now, I've had the opportunity to travel enough to be introduced to foods well beyond what my family grew up eating uh, in Rockbridge County, Virginia. I can promise you I was exposed to things. And, and I am adventurous in my, uh, in my cuisine likings. I, I like trying different types of food. I'm trying to draw my kids into liking different types. I'm dragging them into liking different. And I may not be successful right now, but I'm trying. Uh, but I, I, I'd say the most interesting, bizarre, you could say, un unusual to my normal palate of foods that I've eaten were, were a trip uh, to, to Korea and a trip to Peru. I will not name those items, but I'll just leave them out there. I'm wondering, what were the most bizarre foods you ever ate? Now, if you, if you, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy's name, Andrew Zimmer. Do you remember Andrew Zimmer? Yeah, yeah. He had a show called Bizarre Foods uh, for 13 seasons, and then he did subsequent episodes of this where he would travel the world and try foods that other people are certain are not meant to be eaten, basically. Um, he, everywhere he went, he would try things that, that would, were uncommon or unusual in one way or the other. He, he ate, um, he ate uh, rotten shark, I recall, um, a, a fermented uh, a fish skate, and he said that if you can eat that, then you can eat anything in the world. He, he also ate um, coral worm raw uh, and smashed and made it into a paste that was then put upon uh, bread. And they ate that. Uh, the list goes on and on. And yes, I know you want me to stop, so I will. That's some of the things that he ate and that others have eaten. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is we're in this sermon series called Eat This, Not That. And we're talking about bizarre things uh, in the scriptures that people have eaten. Not really talking about the bizarre things as much as talking about the influence, the significance, the spiritual relevance of the food represents, re, foods represented in the Bible. And particularly the things that we were told to eat and not the other things that the Hebrew people in particular were told to eat. And so we were looking, beginning it last week, with this guy named Ezekiel. Uh, by now, you may know a little bit about him. He was meant to be the high priest in, in Jerusalem, uh, but the people were conquered and, and had been forced off to an exile. And we talked about the exile in the last sermon series with Nehemiah. That's the end of the exile. This is the, the beginning of the exile. And this guy who was a priest, he has been made now a prophet. And God spoke to him and invited him to eat some things that you may not want to eat, right? Um, and maybe you shouldn't. Last week, uh, Pastor Jan shared with us how he was given a vision by God to take the scroll, to break it up into pieces, and to eat the paper of it, to eat the papyrus or the scroll, and to consume it. And what that was representing is not an invitation for us to eat paper, thank God, but instead an invitation for us to make sure we digest the very word of God, that we actually embody it. It becomes part of who we are so that we are living out God's will and more than the words that we would say to ourselves and others about who we are and who are, how we're meant to live these lives. Um, today, people are very prone to tell you how to eat. Amen? I mean, we see it everywhere. I, I, I get told, Pastor, you need to have a vegan diet. Pastor, you need to cut out the carbs. Pastor, you need to do this. Pastor, you need to do that. Now listen, you can tell me how to eat. All right? it, it's fine. I, I, I don't mind. But, but uh, more important, as our scripture is, is going to reveal, is, is what's coming out of us. Now, that said, the scripture passage, Ezekiel 4, if you've never seen it before, it actually gives you a recipe for a meal. It, it is not gluten-free, but it is healthy. Uh, uh, lots of nutrients and minerals and stuff, and they actually have something called Ezekiel bread that's made to the specifics of that recipe found in Ezekiel chapter 4, beginning in verse 9. How many people have ever eaten Ezekiel bread? Two, three, four, five. Oh, a whole bunch back there. Like, how many people like Ezekiel bread? 
Yeah, a less certain right there. So I, because I am dedicated to sermon preparation for you, I bought Ezekiel bread this week, and I have eaten it. I not only got the bread, I got the, the cereal also. And, you know, go full tilt. I mean, we've got to live into the scripture, right? So Ezekiel bread actually says the same verse. It says, take unto thee wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and spelt, and put them into one vessel and, and b- make bread of it. And so this is made according to that recipe. It has all those things in it. And I can say this about it. it it's healthy. <laughs> and, and Pastor Jan was raised on Ezekiel bread. She had to eat it for lunch and, and all kinds of meals. And could, so could you pray for her? Um, and then uh, the cereal, it's straight up sawdust. I want to warn you right now. I added fruits and berries and other things to it, and I just kind of forced it down. But uh, so the, after the sermon today, if anybody would like Ezekiel bread or cereal, it's yours to take. You can have it. Uh, it's a gift from me to you. So you let me know who wants it, and it's yours, um, and I welcome you to eat it. But in this passage, God tells Ezekiel, there's something else I want you to eat. I want you to make bread in this way, and I want you to consume it. Why? Glad you asked. Here's what's going on. The people of Israel are finding themselves in this time of exile. They have believed that if God, it, that God was located over the temple in Jerusalem, like God was geographically, physically located over the temple, and that if they're not at the temple, God can't be with them. Well, now they've been forced to go into exile, and God has come to them and said, turns out I'm here, but I, the word I have for you will, will, might not be an easy word for you to digest. It might be a difficult word for you to digest. It might be, it might be good for you, but not something palatable to you. And so last week, again, he says, here, eat the scroll. And it's sweet to taste, but it's bitter in the stomach because it requires the people to change part of who they are and how they're living. He says, look, we, we want you to be aware. This is an illustration. I want you to be aware that it might sound good, but it may require hard work. It might be difficult on the process. And Pastor Jan talked about that. This week, God has come to Ezekiel and said, look, Ezekiel, I want you to demonstrate, be demonstrative. Live out a physical embodiment of my word to the people of Israel in the exile. They need to be reminded that they're going to go through some really rough things in the coming years. And what he offers then is both a prophecy of what will happen, but it's also a warning that they can approach it in different ways. That they don't have to go about it with a hard heart, hard heart, hardened heart. That they can go about it with a spirit that's open to God being with them. Even there in Babylon, even in the midst of darkness, God can shine a great light, right? And so God comes to Ezekiel and says, I want you to couple, do a couple more things now that you've eaten the scroll. I want you to cut off your hair with a sword. I want you to lay on your side. And I want you to get a brick and a bunch of different little items and a and a a, a steel or cast iron a skillet and thing, and I want you to pre- reenact the siege and the battle of Jerusalem. And so he lays on his side, and he takes these different items. For me, I'm remembering like the army items I had growing up, or the G.I. Joes, and we would ju- I would smash them together and pretend things were shooting at each other. He's, he's literally doing this, and the people, the Hebrew people are watching him do like a play battle of it. It's a reminder of what they've been through and what they're going through. And then he says, lay on that side the whole length, a day for every year or you will be in exile. 390 days and then an additional 40 days. And he says, as you do that, eat of this food. You're not, you don't have to starve, eat of that. And so he, this is the menu presented. And these are the items put in it. And I, I suppose that his wife or somebody brought him the items while he's laying on his side. Uh, but the interesting, the bizarre thing about it is not the ingredients, Amen. Did you hear the scripture this morning? Did you feel like they needed a warning before they were read today? Sorry about that. It's in the scriptures. Maybe you don't remember it. Uh, how many of us remember how it was supposed to be cooked? Don't say it. How, how it was supposed to be cooked? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the interesting thing was not the ingredients. It was the preparation. Put all these things together, mix it together, then bake it over human dung. I never thought I would say that on a Sunday morning in a service before in my life, but it's in the scripture, and I'm trying to present what it has to say. And and to that, Ezekiel goes, okay, Lord, you can ask me to do all of these other things not doing that. Like, that's too, that's disgusting. What are you asking? Why do I have to cook it in that manner? And Ezekiel pleads to God for mercy. And, and, And for good reason. One, because it's, you know, it's rather 
unseemly, but also because he says, look, from my very youth, from the time I was a child, I upheld the kosher laws. I, I lived according to the dietary laws of the Hebrew people. It's one of the things that makes us who we are. There's this, there's that, there's Sabbath rest, and then there's the kosher laws. And Ezekiel says, I know that we're among a people of unclean lips and, and living in an unclean land, but but Lord, don't let me be defiled in this way. Help me to remain holy before you. And so he says, please relent and not make it be cooked in that way. And what God is saying is like, your people, you're, you've, you've given up. You're, it's like you're, you're willing to take on anything at this day. And he's doing this to be shocking. God is issuing this, not for him actually to do it, or for us to do it, thank the Lord, but instead to get our attention, to get the people's attention who are watching us, and to get Ezekiel's attention. Sometimes we need to be shaken before we wake up to the reality of the way that we're living. Amen? Sometimes we need a demonstrative act to wake up to the reality of what's going on. And that's exactly what God is doing in this passage. And in telling Ezekiel to prepare the food in this bizarre, disturbing manner. In the end, God relents and says, okay, you can cook it over cow chips instead of the other. Which actually is a very common thing in the world today. I mean, I've traveled to India where we, uh, in the village, cooked over cow chips and uh, use of fuel and, and all that sort. It's a, it's a common thing. Either way, it's still in a disagreement with the kosher laws. And what God is telling him is now not just abandon everything I've ever told you, but instead I want you to take a look at this in a new way. You are living in a place you weren't supposed to be living or thought you could live. You're living with a dynamic at play that, that you never anticipated. And so you might be tempted to just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, look, I'll just go for the guns and it doesn't matter how I live and what I do. And, and he's offering a warning. He's offering a warning. A warning that I think really connects well to our New Testament passage today where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. And did you hear that passage? In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus has done any number of miracles and wondrous acts. He's feeding thousands of people, turning water into wine, and all of these other things have happened through the various Gospels to this point. And at this stage, he is walking with his disciples. They've come through the fields, and, and as they've come through the fields, they didn't stop first in the temple to wash of their hands seven times before going and having a meal. And so the Pharisees say, stop it! Can you believe what these people who follow Jesus are doing? They're not clean. They are unclean. They're, they're polluted. They, 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 they've, they've brought on pollutant to themselves. They, they're not following our laws. And let's be clear, Jesus is all for washing your hands. Okay, I'm going to just name that. Uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, we talked a lot about washing your hands. You could wash your hands too much, though. That's also true. And what Jesus is saying is, you're, you're making all about this ritual. And, and yeah, yeah, wash your hands, but but you can wash your hands as long as the day is and still not be holy and right with God inside. And what Jesus says is, he quotes Isaiah, a different prophet from the time of the exile, and he says, that the people praise me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You're going to wash your hands seven times, but the things that you're saying, the things you're doing, the, the things you're digesting and the things you're spewing, they're not holy. That matters more than what you eat, Jesus says. He actually turns this teaching on its head, and he says, what defiles, well, let's read it again, what defiles, listen and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. He goes on, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles, for out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands, that doesn't defile. Not in a spiritual way, it doesn't defile. The whole reason for the kosher laws was to keep people connected to God, to be holy before the Lord. And what Jesus is saying is, you're, you look like you're doing it right, but your heart has totally abandoned that. And so, so here are these words of Jesus. What coming out of you matters. The things that you say as well as the things you do, but, but today we're looking at it, particularly the things you say. It really makes a difference in people's lives. It really impacts your relationship and your closeness to God. And whether you're clean or unclean, defiled or undefiled, if you're going to use those terms, it matters then what you're saying to others, and how you represent the faith in yourself 
and your relationship to God. In, in the New Testament, the book of, of James, I love this passage, chapter 3, verse 9, we're reminded that the ability to change how we speak is a very difficult thing to change. Can we get an amen to that? Bridling the tongue, as it says, is, is something that we may not even be capable of doing on our own. And it says in verse 9, with it, that is our, our tongue, with our speech, we bless the Lord, the Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. We bless God and then we curse God's creation, humans made in the image of God. From the same mouth come blessing and curse, my brothers and sisters, this ought not be so, he says. This ought not be so. Oh, I bet there's, if I ask for a show of hands of people who struggle with making sure that what they say glorifies God, it would be every last one of us. It certainly would be me. And with a word here, it's saying that it might be impossible for you to tame your tongue, but he's saying it's only impossible in your own the Holy Spirit is ma- capable of making possible that which otherwise would not be possible. I know that the Lord can change people because I've seen it. Some of us are living witnesses to the fact that God can change people's lives. Sitting and being in worship today, we are embodiments of that, that truth, that reality. And if God can change that aspect of our life, God can change other aspects of our lives, particularly how we speak and whether or not with the things that we say we glorify God. Now, never in the history of time has so much of what we say actually come through our thumbs and our fingers in typing versus what we're actually voicing through our voice box, right? We say sometimes, some of us, far more in typing now than we ever say out loud, but the truth is still the same for both. What we post, what we tweet, what we send out there, it really matters. You know, uh, there's a, a report I saw on the news this week on um, Channel 5 News about a guy named the Great Londoni. Have you heard of this guy? He's on YouTube, and he, he's, he characterizes himself as a TikTok and Twitter vigilante. Now, um, some of his application I don't know about, but I, I can tell you I, I think that his heart is in the right place. I saw this report, and this is what he does. He, he finds the people who, who say the most egregious things on Twitter or on TikTok, or other social media posts, and he tracks them down using his extensive ability to do hacking and, uh, and, re- and research people's backgrounds and, and do that kind of investigation. And he has a team of people who help him with it. And then he doesn't, he says, he doesn't try to kill a fly with a sledgehammer. He doesn't say, everybody, this is the person, here's their address, this is their name, attack them, because that's what they've just done to other people. Instead, he notifies them that they, what they say on the internet, they don't say in isolation. That they, what they say makes an impact on people's lives and that they can be discovered. So many times people post horrible things online with the presumption that they do it with anonymity. And nobody will know who they are and they can hide behind their username, right? And what he does is exposes them and says, no, 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 no. And then he tells them, if they're an adult, I, I know who you are. I, I, I saw this. You're this is doing real harm, and your information could be shared. He doesn't really share it much. If the person is a minor, he shares it with their parents. Oh, God bless those kids, right? <laughs> Woo! He shares it with their parents. Hopefully that changes some behavior, and if it's the most egregious, the ones that are actual threats, he notifies the police for those. Some of the posts are horrible. You know these things. Uh, wish that all trans people should die, or all trans kids should be killed. Um, um, I hope that the, this police officer gets shot in the back of the head next time they're uh, on, in duty. Uh, uh, this girl is so ugly she should commit suicide. These are actual quotes. These are things that people posted thinking that what they said didn't make a difference. It does. In fact, the reason the guy does this work is because a good friend of his had a son who was posting online and uh, some people said to him some awful things, and his friend's son took his life. And so his hope is that people would open their eyes, much like Jesus is opening our eyes, much like Ezekiel is opening the eyes of the people through living out God's call for him to act in this way as a wake-up call, a shaking, a say, hey, it matters what you say. It matters how you say it. You're not going to be perfect in it. Do your best not to do harm in it, too. Jesus says what comes out of your mouth can defile. It can hurt. 
Um, my, my kids play soccer, or at least they have. My daughter had a soccer game yesterday, and I love going to those games. I sit on the sideline, and I get so invested in the game. I'm one of these parents where I'm like, I have to stop myself from shouting out, be like, kick the ball harder, down there, turn around, you know, that kind of stuff. Most of the time I'm going, yeah, good job, good job. I'm not quiet, I have to confess. I am not. They probably wished I were uh, or wish I am, but I'm not. Um, but some of the things said on the sidelines by parents are just not okay. You know, this year, um, there's a lot of industries trying to find employees to do things for extra cash, you know, work in restaurants. Doing, and there's deficits in all kinds of places, in part because of COVID. But, but, the, but the Arlington released uh, announcement, you know, was just a couple weeks ago that they have a drastic shortage in referees. You wonder why? But you can guess. Most of those who were serving as referees were teenagers. They played, maybe they play their high school, right? They play for the teams, and, and they, know the, they know the rules, and so they get a couple extra dollars by refereeing one of the littler kids' teams, and, and then those little, eager, little kids are out there playing, and the teenager's out there, and a parent says something horrible. I've seen it. I witnessed it. I've heard it with my ears, and no wonder those kids don't want to be subjected to it. And the reason they said that they aren't doing it, in part, is because of how horrible the parents have been to them. The awful things said. It's done harm. Things said sometimes can be horribly destructive. It's intuitive. We know it. And yet, that doesn't mean we always change it. Right? We wake up call from God, through Ezekiel, through Jesus, through these examples. Maybe to you or to me to change the way and what we say. Not only what we digest, but that which we offer back into this world by what we say. It's an important thing. You know, when I get in an argument with somebody or I've said something I shouldn't have said, I get a pit in my stomach. I hope you get a pit in your stomach too. I thank God for that pit in my stomach. Because I think this is part of the good news of Jesus Christ. I think that God sends his Holy Spirit to wake us up and say, hey, 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 hey. Come on now, you shouldn't have done it that way. You shouldn't have said it that way. You should be mindful of that which you say in any arena. Because in every arena, God sees and hears what we say and we do. And it turns out from the very words of Jesus, it matters. It matters. So there's some things maybe you would or should cut out from your vocabulary your life. Years ago in my family, we cut out the word stupid from my household. We just didn't find it did any good. There's other words to convey something wasn't done wisely, but to call somebody that word stupid wasn't in any way productive. And so we're not always successful, but we try to cut that word out of our vocabulary and our daily life. The good news is that we, although we may not be able to bridle our tongues successfully and completely, God's Holy Spirit can change that which we cannot in us when we're open to the Holy Spirit, when we not just bless the Lord with our lips, but actually seek to do so in our hearts. And that God gives us a sense of moral right and wrong and sometimes a feeling of how far we are from it. And that is a gift from God. And I praise God for that, and I pray that we, none of us, are so hard-hearted that we can't feel that sense, but instead are drawn to it. I hope that we react like guys. Ezekiel reacted when God said, go ahead and eat like this. And we go, no, that's, there's something I know you want more from me than that. And so I ask that the Lord not, not just use all the ways I have acted, but be mindful completely and fully and continually with that which I give out into the world to make sure that it is, in fact, life-giving and not destructive. Thanks be to God. Amen.